It's hard to get proper, accurate figures, but it's estimated that Git has somewhere in the range of a 90% market share. And this should be really obvious, just speak to a couple of developers. But it's not like prior to April of 2005, source code management or version control systems, whichever term you want to be using, just didn't exist. There were, and in many cases still are, tools in use, like CVS, Bitkeeper, Subversion, Bizarre, and there have been tools since then, like Mercurial, Team Foundation Version Control, and a bunch of others, albeit especially in the case of Subversion, are nowhere near as popular as they once were. But if a bunch of tools already existed, why did Linus bother making Git? Is this a case of that XKCD about standards? In a sense, but not really. To my surprise, when Linux first started, Linus didn't use any source code management. Nothing at all. So if you made a change, you made a change. There was no project history. And Linus said in a retrospective interview, I hated all SCMs with a passion. But how did the kernel development model actually work without something like Git? Well, basically the way it does now, but terribly. So people would post their patch sets up to the Linux Usenet, which eventually became the Linux kernel mailing list. Okay, fine. Linus would then apply these patches to the Linux source tree. Fine again. But what happens when you apply 10, 100, a couple hundred patches and you don't have any history? Well, you can't just revert a commit. There are no commits. It's just one giant block of source code. So when he wanted to release a new version, he would release the entire code base. And if you wanted to see the changes made, you would diff the entire code base against the entire old code base. This is not a scalable solution, but it did function. But SCMs had been around since the 80s, and a lot of developers were starting to get used to them. And a lot of developers also realized that... Linus couldn't keep doing this, like, the kernel would hit a point where it simply could not expand anymore, and luckily, someone came along with a solution, that being Larry McVoy. It's clear that our fearless leader is, at the moment, a bit overloaded, so patches may be getting lost. There are some of us, myself among them, that have been worried about this for a while and are working on a solution. I want to take this time to describe the proposed solution and see if people agree that this would help. For what it's worth, I think that Linus and some of the other kernel people are interested in this solution, and now is perhaps a good time to let the rest of you in on the thinking. Problem is that Linus doesn't scale. We can't expect to see the rate of change to the kernel, which gets more complex and larger daily, continue to increase and expect Linus to keep up. But we also don't want to have Linus lose control and final say over the kernel. He's demonstrated over and over that he is good at that. Now this is the important part. The mechanism which allows all of this to happen is a distributed source management system. The main features of the system are everybody gets a repository, contrast against the one repository model of CVS. This was still a fairly new concept. Changes can be mailed around as super patches, also known as change sets. A change set is just a patch file that contains all the changes, diffs broken into one revision at a time, a commit, an identifier that shows where the patch should be applied in the tree, patches will fail if you aren't as up to date as the sender of the patch, all the revision history for the changes, so a commit history, any other metadata such as path name changes, symbolic tags, etc. A new concept called a line of development. It's logically a branch, but it doesn't need to be on a branch. Patches can and will be their own line of development. You can perform operations on a line of development like apply this to the trunk. So you can have a line of patches that you merge into another line. This sounds a lot like Git, but we all know that Larry didn't make Git. What Larry did do though, is went on to make Bitkeeper by Bitmover Inc. And in 2002, the decision was made to adopt Bitkeeper for kernel development. But Bitkeeper had a bit of a problem. Whilst it had a free community edition, initially it was under a proprietary license. This was changed in 2016 to Apache 2.0, but in 2002, it was the proprietary license. And whilst some were fine to adopt it, 
several key kernel developers completely refused to do so. Also, there were people like Richard Stillman who were not exactly happy about this happening. Also, it had a whole separate issue, the new restrictions on BitKeeper saying that people who contribute to CVS or Subversion and even companies that distribute them cannot even run BitKeeper has sparked outrage. While these specific restrictions are new, their spirit fits perfectly with the previous BitKeeper license. The BitKeeper owners were very worried that somebody using the software would implement their features in an open source project. The spirit of the BitKeeper license is the spirit of the whip hand, is the spirit that says you have no right to use BitKeeper, only temporary privileges that we can revoke. Be grateful that we allow you to use BitKeeper, be grateful and don't do anything we dislike or we may revoke those privileges. It is the spirit of proprietary software. Every non-free license is designed to control the users more or less. Outrage of this spirit is the reason for the free software movement, and as Stillman does, has thrown a jab at the open source movement. If the latest outrage brings the spirit of the non-free BitKeeper license into clear view, perhaps that will be enough to convince the developers of Linux to stop using BitKeeper for Linux development. Now for a time, nothing new happened. A bunch of developers still had no interest in using BitKeeper and were using the old model of sending patches directly to Linus. That's until 2005, when Andrew Tridgell had a bit of fun. Now, Andrew is known for developing things like R-Sync, Nightcap, and Hacking the TiVo to make it work in Australia. But, he also enjoyed analysing proprietary algorithms and protocols to make free and open source software implementations. The exact thing that Bitmover didn't want done to BitKeeper. So, at the time, Andrew was working at the OSDL, the Open Source Development Labs, and he released SourcePuller, a GPL v2 client compatible with the BitKeeper protocol. So, do you know what Bitmover did? They released a press release. Bitmover looks forward to implementing our extensive roadmap and delivering advanced SCM technology to a wider market. As part of this focus, Bitmover has replaced the free version of BitKeeper with the recently released open source BitKeeper client. Those developers who desire additional functionality may choose to migrate to the more powerful commercial version of BitKeeper. Now this might sound like a good thing. Wow, it's under an open source license now. But the open source client wasn't the free client. This was a separate thing. This was a much weaker version of the project, effectively pulling support from the free version. The open source client incidentally enables the extraction of the current version from a repository, but does little else. The PR also states that our relationship with the open source community has been evolving and many of the key developers have already migrated to the commercial version of BitKeeper. Linus however made it clear that he is not one of those developers. Now Linus at the time was working at the OSDL, and the Wikipedia article claims that because Linus was working at the OSDL and they weren't selling keys to the OSDL employees, that's why he didn't get one. There's no source for this, so I cannot confirm that one way or the other. But at the time Linus did say, by the way, don't blame Bitmover even if that's probably going to be a very common reaction. Larry in particular really did try to make things work out, but it got to the point where I decided that I don't want to be in such the position of trying to hold two pieces together that would need as much glue as it seemed to require. Whilst not everybody made use of BitKeeper, the ones who did were very comfortable doing so. We've been using BK for three years, and in fact, the biggest problem right now is that a number of people have gotten very, very picky about their tools after having used the best, me included. But in fact, the people that got helped most by BitKeeper usage were often the people around me who had a much easier time merging with my tree and sending their trees to me. But at this stage, BitKeeper hadn't gone away per se. Right now, the only real thing that had happened is that I've decided to not use BK mainly because I need to figure out the alternatives. And rather than continuing things as normal, I decided to bite the bullet and just see what life without BK looks like. So far, it's a grey and bleak world. This was on April 6th, 2005. So what was there to migrate to? Well... That's sort of the problem. Most of the established version control systems at the time were not 
decentralized version control systems where every single user gets a full copy of the repo. Instead, they were centralized where all of the developers work from the same repo and if they want to work on a specific part of the code base, they would check that code out as if it was a library book. This works great for a company where there are different teams and people are assigned different bits of work. It doesn't work at all in an open source project as big as the kernel. Now Bitkeeper was and Git is a decentralized solution and at the time they were not the only options. Sadly at the time, while well, there were some other SCMs that kind of tried to get the whole distributed thing, none of them did it remotely well. I had performance requirements that were not even remotely satisfied by what was available, and I was also worried about the integrity of the code and the whole workflow, so I ended up just deciding to write my own. Now BK wasn't a speed demon either, actually compared to everything else, BK is a speed demon, often by one or two orders of magnitude, and it took about 10 to 15 seconds per email when I merged with Andrew. However, with BK that wasn't as big of an issue, since the BK to BK merges were so easy, so I never had the slow email merges with any of the other main developers, so a patch application based SCM merger would actually need to be faster than BK is, which is really, really, really hard. Now before Linus went and made his own thing, there was one other solution considered. P.S. Don't bother telling me about Subversion. Subversion being SVN, a centralized solution. If you must, start reading up on Monotone. That seems to be the most viable alternative, but don't pester the developers so much that they don't get any work done. They are already aware of my problems. Now Git in many ways was inspired by both Bitkeeper and also Monotone. Minus the way that Monotone was written, which he talked about in 2007. C++ is a horrible language. It's made more horrible by the fact that a lot of substandard programmers use it to the point where it's much, much easier to generate total and utter crap with it, quite frankly, even if the choice of C were to do nothing but keep the C++ programmers out, that in itself would be a huge reason to use C. So I'm sorry, but for something like Git where efficiency was a primary objective, the advantages of C++ is just a huge mistake. The fact that we annoy people who cannot see that is just a big additional advantage. If you want a version control system that is written in C++, go play with Monotone. Really, they use a real database. They use nice object-oriented libraries. They use nice C++ abstractions. And quite frankly, as a result of all these design decisions, that sounds so appealing to some CS people. The end result is a horrible and unmaintainable mess. But I'm sure you'd like it more than Git. Shortly after this email was sent on April 6th, 2005, work was begun on Git. You can actually see how it all took shape in the Git source code repository, except for the very first day or so, it took about a day to be self-hosting so that I could start committing things into Git using Git itself. So the first day or so is hidden, but everything else is there. The work was clearly mostly during the day, but there's a few midnight entries and a couple of 2am ones. The most interesting part is how quickly it took shape. The very first commit in the git tree is not a lot of code, but it already did the basics enough to commit itself. The trick wasn't really so much the coding, but coming up with how it organizes the data. And that commit can be seen right here, April 8th, 2005, initial revision of git, the information manager from hell. And you'll notice that there is a lot of comments marked as off topic. Being on GitHub, um, people have discovered this over the years and have left you know, whatever dumb things they want to say. And from there, the rest is basically history. Git now runs not just the Linux development model, but the vast majority of developers only know Git and only use Git. There are a couple of people that need to use specific other things from companies that just keep using a tool they've used forever, but the vast majority of developers only ever interact with Git, with many people relying on services like GitHub, which started in 2008. I may have forgot to record the outro, so that's going to be it for me. Uh, let me know, do you use Git? Do you use things that are not Git? It's like 10.30pm right now and I want to go to bed. So if you like the video, go like the video, and if you really like the video, and you want to become one of these amazing people over here, check out the Patreon, subscribe, and the Barrow Pay linked in the description down below. 
That's going to be it for me, and peace out.